when you're talking about sugar, you're not talking about fruit, correct? So let, let, let's do the sugar and fruit story, okay? Because everyone always asks about it and say, you're telling me I can't eat fruit? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. Here's the problem. You get a sugar bolus into your stomach and then your duodenum and then your jejunum. It gets absorbed. It goes straight to the liver. The liver can metabolize a limited amount in the same way it can metabolize a limited amount of alcohol. If you stay below that level, then the fructose didn't do any damage. But the chances are that you over exceeded your limit. Hmm. For adult men, that limit is about 37 grams a day. For adult women, that's about 25 grams a day. For kids, it's about 12 and a half grams a day. For toddlers, it's about three grams a day. And for infants, it's zero grams a day. Okay. So there's a limit to how fast your liver can clear the fructose. If you stay below that level, you'll be fine. Fruit does have fructose in it. It does. But it's at low level. It's not like fruit is absolutely chuck, smack, glommed, full of fructose. There's actually, yes, it's sweet, but it's not crazy sweet. Okay? Mm. And the fruit has the antidote packaged right alongside the sugar. It's called fiber. The fiber in the fruit forms a gel on the inside of the intestine. And what that gel does, is the, the soluble and the insoluble fiber together form this gel. And you can actually see it on electron microscopy. It forms a secondary barrier that prevents absorption of glucose and fructose into the bloodstream. Number one, you have a lower dose because it's fruit compared to, say, a fruit juice. And number two, the fiber in the fruit acts as a barrier that prevents absorption so that you're not overwhelming your liver. You're not causing the liver to basically give up because you've, basic, you've made it awash in this huge tsunami of sugar that you've exposed it to. So fruit is okay because, number one, the dose is lower and the fiber is there. And that's what makes fruit okay. Fruit juice is another story because the fiber has been removed and the sugar has been concentrated. Because how many apples can you eat? How many glasses of apple juice can you drink? Right. I'd love to dive more into that because in, in prepping for this, I was talking to somebody yesterday and I was like, why, are, why is it so much easier for somebody to drink app or to drink orange juice than to eat an orange. I would love for you to talk up to share your thoughts on fruit juice and why or why not it's is it's as healthy as eating fruit. So my uh cookbook co-author who is a nutrition educator in the East Bay in uh, Walnut Creek, her name is Cindy Gershon. And every year uh, she taught the nutrition sciences class over at Mount Diablo High School. And every year, she always started with the same first experiment on the first day. Okay, so the kids are coming in. These are all, this is a Title I school with poor kids, probably haven't even eaten breakfast. All right. And they all come in, and she takes two kids from the class as the experiment. And she hands one kid six oranges. And she says to the first kid, here, kid, here's six oranges. To make juice. So the kid squeezes the six oranges, gets 12 and a half ounces, downs the glass and says, okay, what's for breakfast? The second kid, she hands the kid six oranges and she says to the kid, here kid, eat the six oranges. Kid eats orange number one, orange number two, orange number three, gets to orange number four and throws up. Hmm. 
She's got the vomit basin ready because it always happens on orange number four. Okay. And the kid goes, I'm going to die. And then the kid doesn't eat lunch or dinner either. Hmm. So what happened? The fiber happened. The fiber made the fruit self-limiting. The fiber reduced your capacity to overconsume. And the reason is because the fiber moves the food through the intestine faster to get to the end of the intestine where the satiety signal or the peptide YY hormone lives. The food gets to the end, the peptide YY gets released into the bloodstream, goes to the brain, tells the brain, I am satiated. I'm not going to eat another drop. The fiber makes that happen faster. So that's why the fruit is okay, because the fiber does double duty. It acts at the uh, intestine to reduce absorption, and it also acts to reduce, uh, at the end of the intestine, to reduce consumption. What about some of the foods that people typically might feel are healthy, like certain cereals or even certain protein bars that have yeah. fiber in them? Like, where does the fiber come from? And do you recommend people eating those or staying away from that? So the, there, there are two kinds of fiber. I mentioned it before, soluble and insoluble. So soluble fibers like pectin or inulin, like what holds jelly together. Insoluble fibers, cellulose, like the stringy stuff in celery or cardboard for that matter. Okay, all that's cellulose. Now, real food has both. You need both. And the reason is because the insoluble fiber, the stringy stuff, forms a lattice work on that inside of that intestine, that gel I mentioned. Okay. It has a structure. It has a lattice work, like a fishnet, if you will. Okay. The soluble fiber, they're globular. They plug the holes in the fishnet. And so together, they form this secondary barrier. When the food industry takes the fiber out of the food, they take both out. They take the soluble and insoluble. Okay, so now it's fiberless food. Some companies will try to add fiber back, like fiber one bars, high fiber cereal. And what they're adding back is usually something like inulin, which is immunogenic and can cause uh, GI distress, or psyllium, like what's in Metamucil, okay, which gels if you add water to it. And that's not necessarily setting up that gel like we talked about, because there's no insoluble fiber. And the food industry hasn't figured out how to add insoluble fiber back to the food yet. So what the food industry is doing is basically telling you, oh, yeah, we put the fiber back. Yeah, we put the soluble fiber back, but we didn't put all the fiber back. We didn't put the insoluble fiber back, and therefore, it's not really working like you want it. I'd love to get your thoughts on smoothies, because I think a lot of times when people are trying to make a health transformation and transition from eating a diet that's full of ultra processed foods and eating more whole foods smoothies can become a way for them to do that what are your thoughts on smoothies are they in the same category as fruit juice like how do you feel about that so there are two kinds of smoothies there's fruit smoothies and there's green smoothies now fruit smoothies have sugar green smoothies don't okay green smoothies are vegetables the question is, what are you trying to prevent the absorption of? And the answer is, in the green smoothie, nothing. So if you take all the vegetables and throw it into a Vitamix or a Breville or a Magic Bullet or Cuisinart or whatever else, whatever machine you, you, you prefer, okay, and you smoothie the green vegetables to smithereens and you basically destroy all the insoluble fiber because you've sheared it into such a gamish that there's no lattice work, there's no fishnet to be able to construct. It doesn't matter because there was nothing to inhibit the absorption of. So green smoothie, 
if you want to destroy your insoluble fiber, have at it. Who cares? On the other hand, the fruit smoothie's got lots of sugar in it. Now, not as much as a soda, but still lots of sugar. And the goal is to keep that gel, that meshwork, that latticework, that fishnet intact. If you take all that fruit and throw it in a smoothing machine, the blades of the machine are going to shear those insoluble fiber strands into nothingness. They won't be able to build the fishnet in the intestine. And now you will absorb all of that sugar that came from the fruit. So the way I look at it is eat your fruit, don't drink it. You often hear that fiber, one of the big benefits of fiber is satiety benefits, right? It helps keep yep. you fuller longer. You, you hear the same also about protein. Do you think mm -hmm. that adding in a, a good quality protein powder to a fruit smoothie can be beneficial as far as how the body responds to it? So that sounds like a good idea. And on the surface, it might be a good idea. But in fact, you have to delve a little bit deeper here. Mm -hmm. So protein powder that you buy at you know, the general a GNC or the health food store or whatever, okay? the thing the bodybuilders add to their smoothies, right? What is what is that? What is in protein powder? And the answer is it's a lot of branch chain amino acids. BCAA is their goal. Branch chain amino acids. Mm -hmm. Leucine, isoleucine, valine. Now, muscle is 20% branch chain amino acids. So if you're building muscle, if you're a bodybuilder and you're pumping iron, then you need those branch chain amino acids in order to be able to build muscle. By the way, those are essential amino acids. You have to consume them. Your body doesn't make them. There are 20 amino acids, but you only have to consume nine. They're essential. The body can turn those nine into the other 11, okay, to get the 20. But you got to eat the nine. And it turns out all the branched amino acids are all essential. So the only place you get them is your food. All right. If you're a bodybuilder and you need branched chain amino acids, add a scoop of protein powder to your smoothie. No sweat because you have a place to put them. But what if you're not a bodybuilder? What if you're a mere mortal like me? Okay, and you eat a porterhouse steak, okay, because you're probably not drinking a smoothie, but you're eating a steak and it's filled with branched chain amino acids because it was a corn fed beef and corn has lots of branched chain amino acids. What are you going to do if you're not building muscle? What happens to the amino acids if you're not building muscle? They go to the liver, the liver can't store them because the only place to store them is in muscle. So the liver has to do something with them. It takes the amino group off. So now it's a branch chain organic acid. And then that gets filtered into the Krebs cycle, the tricarboxylic acid cycle, the cycle that creates energy from the, in the liver. The problem is the TCA cycle gets overwhelmed and when the cycle gets overwhelmed, the liver has a failsafe, a, a pop-off, and that gets turned into fat. So those branch chain amino acids end up as liver fat. And then that liver fat can either be exported out, raising your triglycerides and increasing your risk for heart disease or obesity, or that liver fat will precipitate in the liver. Now you've got fatty liver disease which puts you at greater risk for diabetes and Alzheimer's disease. Branch chain amino acids are okay if you're building muscle and not okay if you're not. For the bodybuilders out there, don't kill me. If you want to if you want to put a, a scoop of protein powder in your smoothie and you're building muscle, great. Have at it. But do I think this is a good idea for everyone else? No. It, when it compares to soda, you, you touched on soda earlier. If somebody is just looking to make something that's sweet for them, that's going to be a better option than soda if they were somebody that habitually drinks soda every day or every right. week, smoothies aren't as bad as soda, correct? No. Soda's like the worst because right. they're, 
it's basically straight sugar, no fiber, no nothing, no nutrition whatsoever. Sodas are the devil incarnate, without question. Trans fats used to be, but we know that, and so they're now removed from our diet. So now it's soda. And we're doing everything we can to try to reduce consumption of soda in this country. And it is very difficult. As But if you're going to stop drinking soda, then maybe you would start drinking diet soda. Okay? Because after all, no calories, no fructose. Should be better, right? Not necessarily. Turns out those diet sweeteners have their own effects. And those effects are not necessarily good ones. Turns out they change the microbiome, they change the, the bacteria in the intestine, and they increase the intestinal gut permeability, thus a phenomenon called leaky gut, which sets you up for insulin resistance and chronic metabolic disease also. And also when you put something sweet on the tongue, like a diet sweetener, the message goes tongue to brain, sugar's coming, message goes brain to pancreas, sugar's coming, release the insulin. And it turns out, you still make insulin. And if you make insulin, you're going to drive energy into fat, and you're still going to generate chronic metabolic disease. So the data on diet sweeteners is that one Coca-Cola, the toxicity of one Coca-Cola equals the toxicity of two diet Coca-Colas. So half as bad. Now, half as bad does not mean good. It means half as bad. All right. The problem is that the diet soda drinker thinks I can have 10 of them. 